Great. Okay. <laughs> Thanks for jumping in there, Lauren. <laughs> I, I know that there are people watching this. <laughs> Can't see them. It's been such a weird year that way, as you, as you all know. I'm going to see if I can get my slides up. There we go. Okay. Um, this is a this is the statistical age, right? So we have to start with that. But first, um, I don't know if all of you have a an email address for me. If if for those of you that I don't get to to talk to or interact with, uh, uh, please uh, just let me know where you are and what you've been up to. <laughs> Some of you, it'll be for the last thirty years, which is really incredible. Um, it's great to see the list of of participants. Um, so that was good. Anyway, some statistics. So yeah, 44 years of college teaching at a, several different institutions, mostly at Lawrence. All the schools um, besides UW-Madison were all on a three terms a year system, a calendar that is vanishing as many of you know. And then um, some, uh, some other statistics. Um, 3,757 students. Uh, some of you uh, are, are familiar with the groan that would go up from looking at 59 committees and 29 search committees and <laughs> the task forces and stuff like that. There's been a lot of really good things to do here. Now, before I get started, I just wanna say that this talk was developed for um, current students that I had this past term and for lots of friends and relatives and people from the community that were just interested in getting in on a, on a last lecture, on a last chance to say something. So I developed this talk to be a fairly non-technical. Many of you will recognize that there are some fairly profound issues of mathematics and philosophy and even metaphysics that are alluded to in this. And <clears throat> I totally invite you to <laughs> interact with me over that. But I just want to tell you that um, this was developed as something that wasn't supposed to like go into a huge amount of, of detail on any of those areas, but to give people an idea um, around the topic. OK, so that's what I'm going to do. Okay, now to begin, we have to understand, and I'm sure many of you do understand what is meant in the 1700s by a salon, namely a social gathering for discussion and, and usually a fairly seriously planned social gathering for discussion. You're really supposed to learn something at a salon. You, it would be good if you, if, if you could bring something to the table, an area of expertise that you could discuss. Um, so I, I want to introduce uh, two characters in this talk, and the first one I'm going to introduce by paraphrasing from a diary, a diary of a Monsieur, Monsieur de Brosses, who on a day in 1736 attended a salon at the home of a silk merchant in Milan. So I'll paraphrase him in the first person, it'll just avoid awkward tenses and, and pronouns. He says, there were about 30 persons of several different nations of Europe sitting in a circle, including a young woman of roughly 18 years with her little sister. Count Bellome, who had invited me to the salon, began a lively but formal speech in Latin to the young lady. She answered with great readiness and ability in the same language, and they then entered into a disputation, still in Latin, on the origin of fountains and on the causes of the ebbing and flowing which is observed in some of them, and whether there is a similarity between the intermittent behavior of fountains and the tides of the sea. I never heard the subject treated in a manner that gave me more satisfaction. I found out later that this young lady was fluent in seven languages and always ready to discuss with surprising authority any of the sciences anyone should choose to discuss with her. Now, the young woman was Maria Agnesi, the daughter of the silk merchant at whose home the salon was held. She had been educated by very good tutors in a wide variety of subjects, but not much at this point in 1736 in mathematics. But shortly after the meeting that de Brosses described, she was introduced more systematically to mathematics by a local monk who was enough of a scholar to get her started on the most advanced treatises of the day. Here's a front piece to Leibniz calculus book. Thought you might find that interesting. 
By four years later in 1740, she had made such exceptional progress that she was thoroughly competent in the advanced mathematics of her day. And 10 years after that in 1750, she was 32 years old to keep track and has just been appointed to an academic chair as professor of mathematics, physics and natural philosophy at the University of Bologna. Here's a modern day picture of that institution, having been recommended for that position by no less a figure than the Pope. So um, not bad, right? Well, we're gonna temporarily leave um, Agnesi to introduce our other character moving from Milan to Basel, Switzerland. Uh, here's a, a ducat from, from Basel that has a, an interesting illustration of the city. So Leonhard Euler, we're not sure how old he was when he made this portrait, but presumably somewhat young. He was born in Basel into much humbler circumstances than Maria Agnesi. But still, as was typical for the time, his middle-class parents arranged for him to obtain a basic education in a variety of subjects. They recognized early on his remarkable facility with and memory for geometry and arranged for a special tutor in mathematics. Now, by, by a wonderful coincidence, one of the best mathematicians of the time resided in Basel, Johann Bernoulli. Um, he has a, a very interesting story. He was something of a religious and political refugee in, in Basel, but we'll, we'll stick with, with Euler. Anyway, um, Bernoulli was not a guy who would just take on somebody you know, at the drop of a hat, but he agreed to meet with uh, the young Euler and by 1726, when Euler was 19, he had accomplished the equivalent of a PhD in applied mathematics and began to look around himself for a job. Now, um, we need to think about two of Bernoulli's children, his oldest, Nicholas, it's a portrait of him, and the next youngest, Daniel, this is a picture of Daniel when he was quite a bit older. Uh, but anyway, that's kind of what they look like. It looks like everybody had curly hair for some reason, okay? Um, they were in their 20s. Their father had arranged for them to obtain faculty positions at the recently founded Russian Academy in St. Petersburg. Here's a picture of St. Petersburg in early development. The Russian ruler, Peter the Great, had wanted to start a university in Russia comparable to the best European universities of the day. He supplied generous funds arranged for faculty duties to include plenty of time for research, and he recruited the best students he could find in Russia. In 1726, Nicholas died of appendicitis and Daniel moved up to Nicholas's position in mathematics. This left an opening in physiology where Daniel had had a position, Daniel Bernoulli, and the, the position in physiology Bernoulli recommended Euler. He arranged for Euler to room with Daniel, his son, with the idea that Daniel would assist Euler, kind of keep his, his studies going. Their relationship ended up going really the other way, although Daniel Bernoulli was certainly no slouch in mathematics, Euler soon outpaced him and began to, uh, you know, kind of teach him what was going on. So that's kind of interesting. Now, Euler found St. Petersburg quite rustic and undeveloped. Um, one of the features of the city that houses were made almost exclusively of wood and were packed very closely together in a small area around the, the sort of river that outlets to the sea. And so there were frequent house fires. In fact, almost the entire city was destroyed around 1736 by a huge fire. So it was kind of a awkward place to live in some ways. Um, and I mentioned that Euler's appointment was in physiology, not really mathematics. Among other duties, he served as an on-call naval medic, <laughs> okay? So, but he did okay. Um, in 1734, he married another Swiss expatriate, Katerina Gazelle, whose father was a painter. I think I understand that he painted this portrait. Now, here's a picture of the St. Petersburg Academy. Um, it can't be that the entire two rows of, of buildings here are the academy. It seems to have been at the end and maybe extending in uh, there, but that's what the picture is called. Now at the academy, Euler moved up the ladder. In 1731 at age 24, he was made professor of physics. 
Two years later, Daniel Bernoulli left for a better position and Euler succeeded himself, succeeded Daniel and found himself the 26 year old head of the mathematics department. Now I've introduced you to two persons who in their youth demonstrated truly exceptional potential and who in early adulthood began to realize that potential. Many of us who teach um, just uh, enjoy over and over again the recognition of student potential and the uh, trying to develop a vision for where that potential might go and how it might be developed. These two were very fortunate that those around them recognized and encouraged their progress. Okay, now I want to talk next about some of the mathematical ideas of Agnesi and Euler. Remember I said I gotta be careful not to get too technical here. To do that, we need to go all the way back to the Greek uh, philosopher Zeno, famous for his so-called paradoxes, which are logical puzzles meant to poke at the relationship between mathematical ideas and the physical world. Zeno's paradoxes have many, many versions. Um, and so here's one of them. This is the one I happen to like. Uh, we imagine a skilled archer shooting an arrow at a target. Zeno thinks about what the arrow has to do before it gets to the target. He notices that before the arrow hits the target, it has to pass the halfway point between to the target. And then once it has passed the halfway point, before it hits the target, it has to pass a point three quarters of the way to the target. Once it is past that point, it has to pass a point seven eighths of the way to the target. Once it has passed that point, it has to pass a point 15 sixteenths of the way to the target. And the interesting thing about this list is that it is unending. Now we bandy about the word infinity or we think of the infinite. Uh, we've become a little bit too uh, coy about what that word means. It needs to settle into your, your mind that the arrow has an, an unending list of tasks uh, to perform before it hits the target. So of course, how can the arrow hit the target? Now, remember that I said this was a skilled archer. <laughs> so the arrow does hit the target. You can see that happening. Now, I know that many of you have either heard or thought about or discussed um, purported solution to this kind of paradox with the unending to-do list. Um, I know you can, you, you can imagine, for example, the distances that the arrow travels. It travels one half the way to the target, then one fourth, then one eighth, then one sixteenth. So it's total distance is a, a sum of a bunch of numbers like this. Now, you know that there is a kind of mathematical tension in this sort of a sum. Um, on the one hand, it never ends. There's more and more and more. There's always another number to add. Uh, on the other hand, the numbers that you're adding are smaller and smaller and so make less and less of, a, of an impact as they come in. And if you remember seeing such sums, you might remember uh, that this mathematically, the sum of these numbers is taken to be one. Now, in the intervening centuries after Zeno, people have come up with many ways to explain this sum, all kinds of ways to think about this. Um, it's such a commonplace that I bet many of you who, who are familiar with mathematics just sort of think of this sum as being one and, and with hardly a, a second thought about it and maybe not remembering that there is some non-trivial theory underneath this, including some fundamental and rather deep properties of numbers, but you still get one when you're, when you're all done with this, whatever being all done means when you have an unending list. Now, for the purpose of this talk though, I wanna point out the interesting thing about these explanations is they explain the mathematics, which is a lovely subject, but they don't really even try to explain the, how the motion of the arrow corresponds to the mathematical objects that are being considered uh, when the motion occurs. We explain the arrow that we can see using mathematical concepts that we can't see, at least not with our eyes in the same way that we can literally see the arrow. Now, of course, ideas from abstract mathematics are used in all the sciences every day. It has always intrigued me that we don't have an agreed upon explanation why this should be. Um, why the arrow should be convinced, so to speak. Suffice to say that there has long been a felt gap 
between ideas of abstract mathematics and the concrete objects of the physical world. But the fact of that gap doesn't seem to bother any of the practitioners very much. Now I want to, uh, to segue back to Euler and, and Agnesi, I want to point out that in the 16 and 1700s, there was actually a similar kind of gap between the part of mathematics that was considered concrete and well-established and new ideas that were harder to grasp. It's kind of a parallel here, harder to see, if you will. Ideas that seem to have an unreality to them. Now I need you to have some understanding of that gap in order for you to understand something of the mathematical work of Agnesi and Euler. So I need to go back before them just a bit to another infinite sum. Again, one that I know some, many of you have seen and maybe not all of you. Um, Wallace, Leibniz and others in the 1600s now, so the previous century, considered the sum of inverses, one over one plus one over two plus one over three plus one over four and so on. And they, um, this is the same kind of tension. There's more and more numbers. There's always a next number to add, um, but they get smaller and smaller. So maybe they make less difference as things go on. Now this sum can be estimated rather concretely using area formulas. And when you do that, you see that in fact, what happens, surprisingly what happens is that the sum just gets larger and larger and larger and larger. And in fact, it exceeds every possible number eventually. Now it does this rather slowly, which is interesting. In other words, it, get, it eventually gets big, but slowly. So I thought it might be interesting to just ask, how far do you have to add up these numbers before you, you get something bigger than 10? You know, eventually it'll be bigger than 10. And the answer is you have to go up to about 23,000. So you have to go pretty far, but eventually you get something bigger than 10. Eventually you get something bigger than a million, eventually a billion, you know, it just keeps going. Now, both Agnesi and Euler learned mathematics in a context that thought of geometry as a direct representation of real space around us. Therefore, the theorems of geometry had a very solid reality to them. You know, stretches stretching back to Euler's, uh, not to Euler, to Euclid's elements in 300 BC. Number algebra was built on geometry, and so it was considered equally unassailable. So in this setting, there is between every pair of points in space a definite distance that can be measured, at least theoretically, as a positive number. Now, the inventors of the calculus began to consider pairs of points that were so close that there's no distance between them, and yet the points are not the same. Their distance is what is called an infinitesimal. An infinitesimal is a quantity that is not zero, but it is also not positive. It is smaller than any positive number. So it can't be a number, whatever it is. And if the distance between points P and Q is in infinitesimal, then P and Q are not the same point, but there's no measurable distance between them. And if you say, well, wait, how can that happen? The answer is, well, it was controversial. <laughs> so we're gonna talk about this a little bit. And we're going to um, go to the year 1748 for both of our two uh, characters here. In 1748, Agnesi published a book called The Analytic Institutions, a very groundbreaking calculus book. It really is, it really is great to read. It's in Latin, but you can read it. Um, and I just wanted to, to look at a, a couple of pictures from this book just to try to give you an idea of the kind of thinking that was going on. <clears throat> Many of you know that one of the um, things that you're interested in in the calculus are tangent lines. You have a curve and a point on the curve and you want to understand what the tangent line looks like, the line that just touches the curve at that one point there. That's not actually a definition, but it'll be good enough for what we're talking about. So the, the idea is that if you move along the tangent line, you move off of the curve. If you move along the curve, you move off of the tangent line. Now, Agnesi draws a picture of a point she calls Q, which is infinitely close to the point P where the tangent line is. Now, Q is infinitely close. It is an in, it, the distance between P and Q is an infinitesimal. So Q is both on the curve and on the tangent line, okay? <laughs> How can that be? <laughs> well, it is. But it's but it's it's uh, there's no measurable distance between P and Q because of that property. 
Now the point Q can't be a real point, but the calculations that Agnesi does is that she uses this infinitesimal point Q to actually get information about the tangent line. So it shines a light on what is visible or measurable, even though it is not itself something visible or measurable. It predicts that its arrow hits the target, if you will. Now, Euler, in the same year, 1748, published a book, another book on analysis called The Analysis of the Infinite. I, I think one of the funniest things, or well, a funny thing about this book is in the preface, Euler says, you know, my students would be able to learn this stuff better if their algebra was better. <laughs> so <laughs> fast forward to 1990, weren't we saying the same things about you guys or the or 2004 or whatever class you're in, if they just knew their algebra better, you know. But anyway, um, Euler uses well understood algebraic formulas and thinks about what would happen to those formulas if infinitely small numbers are used in them. And he was an absolute master of how to do this. You get some very surprising discoveries. So I wanna just talk about two of those discoveries. The two I, I think are, these are both very remarkable. One of the problems that people were considering was the sum of the inverses of the primes. The primes are the numbers that don't have a proper factorization. Four is two times two and six is two times three. Those are proper factorizations, but seven is only seven times one. Um, so when you look at the inverses of the primes, one half, one third, one fifth, one seventh, and so on, you wonder what happens, okay? Now, this is that same kind of tension there's more and more and more of them. If I don't know if you remember this, there's infinitely many primes. There's always another prime number, no matter how far you go. But obviously these ratios get smaller and smaller and smaller. Now we have two examples already and we wonder which is this one more like? Is this one more like the arrow sum, one half, one fourth, one eighth, that adds up to something definite? Or is this more like the inverse sum, one half, one third, one fourth, that, that, goes, that gets arbitrarily large? Which is it like? Well, the very surprising fact about this one is that this becomes arbitrarily large. It eventually exceeds every possible number. That has got to be very, very surprising. You just, you know, you try to add up the first billion of these and see what you get. Now you might wonder, this also, um, like the inverse sum, this goes to get bigger and bigger very, very slowly. So um, I calculated, how far would you have to go with this sum in order for it to be bigger than 10? Like how, how far would you have to go in the prime numbers? And the answer is you have to take all the prime numbers less than 10 to the 9,566 power. <laughs> one with 9,566 zeros. Yeah, don't try to write it down. Um, just for reference or a comparison, the current estimate is that there are about 10 to the 80th electrons in the entire universe. So this is a big, big number, but that's how far you have to go. You have to go to all take all the primes less than this number to add their inverses and get something bigger than 10, okay? So it takes its dear sweet time, but it gets larger and larger. Now, here was a problem that um, Johann, Johann Bernoulli had suggested to Euler when Euler was actually fairly young. It's another problem that this comes up in applied mathematics in several ways, which I won't try to explain. It was kind of a problem in the air but you wondered what happens when you add the inverse squares. One squared is one, two squared is four, three squared is nine, four squared is 16. Keep doing that, okay? And again, that's more and more, smaller and smaller. So there's some tension there. And you wonder, is this like the arrow sum that adds up to something? Or is this like the inverse sum and the prime inverse sum that get larger and larger? And Euler discovered, uh, I think the most surprising formula in mathematics that in fact, these numbers add up mathematically to the number pi squared over six. <laughs> you have to explain where the pi squared comes from. One of the things I always enjoyed doing in my undergraduate teaching was to try uh, at various levels and in various courses show proofs of this, of this formula because there's, there's, a, there's a bunch of different proofs and they're all fun. Euler found a way to, uh, to relate this sum to trigonometry, to angles and circles and stuff. And at least that kind of explains where the pi comes from. But Euler was a master of finding relationships between formulas and tension. Now, 
The problems that I've touched on here, only touched on of Agnese and Euler can be related to physical problems of mass and motion. In each case, the infinitesimals have no physical analog, but seem to explain something profound about what happens in the physical situation. Somehow the arrow hits the target. Now, many of my listeners, I just want to an aside to those of you that have had some mathematics, just to say something about this. Many of my listeners have learned what is called the theory of limits that explains the calculus in general and infinite sums in particular. You probably didn't use infinitesimals to do that. So I just want to say something about that. Without digressing too much, I'll say that in the 1960s, it was shown that whether you use infinitesimals or the theory of limits, like you do in, in a normal calculus now, you end up with exactly the same mathematical theorems, formulas, and applications. Neither is preferable on mathematical grounds. They both give you the same set of facts when all the dust settles. And neither seems to do a better job of connecting abstract mathematical ideas to physical objects. So what I think is interesting is that in a fundamental way, we remain standing next to Zeno, watching the archer, with a puzzled expression on our faces. Now, many of us know that our perception of early potential and success change over the long arc of years. Some of us have had a longer arc of years than others. Promise adapts itself to larger life goals as we will see in the lives of our two mathematicians. So here's a map of St. Petersburg um, as it was being developed. You see the waterways I mentioned. Euler went to St. Petersburg in 1726. 15 years later, he had many accomplishments and his reputation had grown, but he felt isolated. Travel to St. Petersburg was difficult. And although Euler had some eminent visitors, they didn't come very often and he was not able to visit other people very often either. His students were enthusiastic and he was a generous and popular teacher but they were not at his level. He didn't have anyone to really work with. So what we do is we're going to turn to Frederick the Great, or as many of his subjects knew him, Old Fritz. Old Fritz was doing in Berlin what Peter the Great had done in St. Petersburg. He was trying to build a university to compete with the best schools in France and England. Frederick's Royal Prussian Academy of Sciences, is the building, was somewhat more successful than the St. Petersburg Academy in that old Fritz was better able to recruit first-class talent from across Europe, both students and faculty. Frederick recruited two mathematicians, both famous, but available at relatively low prices. He wasn't sure how much he valued mathematics. One of them was Euler, who was very happy to go <clears throat> to Berlin. Among mathematicians, Euler being lured to the Prussian Academy was seen as a coup on the part of Frederick. Frederick himself seems not to have appreciated what he had in Euler, but he was happy enough with the bargain and with the fact that Euler turned out to be a hard worker and he took on lots of extra tasks. Now here's a portrait of Euler of substantially older. Uh, the thing that people always notice is that his right eye is troubled. He had some, he was, his eyesight was deteriorating. Euler was in Berlin for 25 years and his reputation among mathematicians kept growing, but not so much his standing with others in the Prussian Academy. He was belittled by many of the French intellectuals, notably Voltaire. He was scorned for his religious beliefs, which were considered old fashioned. And he was even ridiculed for his deteriorating eyesight. As his children reached maturity, there were few opportunities for them. So there were some social barriers going on there too, probably. In the end, Euler was dissatisfied with the Prussian Academy and sought to negotiate a return to St. Petersburg. It was not all that easy to get out of his contract with Frederick, but he eventually prevailed and the St. Petersburg Academy was very happy to have him back. Besides his salary, he was guaranteed a pension that would persist should he die before his wife, which ended up being the case. And there were employment avenues for his mature children. The disadvantages of St. Petersburg remained, but on the whole, Euler was glad to have returned. His eyesight continued to deteriorate. Eventually, he had to dictate research papers from memory. In 1775, he's com almost completely blind, and he dictated 52 papers from memory to some, 
person having to write them down. <clears throat> and he died in 1783. Turning to Agnesi, although she appreciated her appointment at the University of Bologna, she found herself too busy with other pursuits to continue to devote extended time on mathematics. Regarding her mathematical work, there's a, a quote of hers, this is somewhat famous. I think it's somewhat understood because it may come across as a little bit flippant, but it's nothing, nothing of the sort. She's, she's being very carefully and careful and measured. Of course, she's speaking in Italian, not English. <laughs> but she says, it was never my design to court applause, being satisfied with having indulged myself in a real and innocent pleasure. That's her description of mathematics. And at the same time, having endeavored to be useful to the public, trying to help people learn. By the mid 1740s, she was caring for her father who had become severely ill. She became interested in teaching less technical subjects and she engaged in many works of charity. Around the time of her father's death in 1752, she began an intense study of theology and church history. There are two subjects that were of interest to Euler too all his life. In 1771, she entered a convent, and in 1783, as part of her work as a nun, she founded a home for the infirm, the Hospice Trivuzio of the Blue Nuns of Milan. Wish I could find a picture of that, that institution. She was very well known for her compassion, religious devotion, and her administrative ability, and she died in 1799. Now, there is always a gap between abstract ideas and their realization between potential and success, between the idea of a career and the trajectory of a working life. We know quite a bit about how that played out in the lives of our two figures, in Agnesi's case, because her actions were demand, dramatic and definitive, moving in the direction of her sense of a calling higher than professional work. Euler explains his own philosophy in detail in tutorial letters he wrote when he lived in Berlin. And his reasoning is not unlike that of Agnesi. He felt that successful teaching and research depends on a perspective that involves something larger than the individual and a commit commitment to be a certain kind of person independent of the influence of circumstances. Now, my listeners are at different stages of their uh, scholarly or professional lives. I wish for all of you to find such perspective and commitment I have a great deal of respect for these two persons that I've discussed and have tried in my own small way to pattern my conduct after theirs. The greatest joy I have had is to see potential realized in my students and to see life direction guided by perspective and commitment. So thank you very much. Wish we could all be in the same room together and I could see you. Well, thank you so much, Alan. That was fascinating. I um, I was thinking about the fact that Meg Pickett was saying it would be great to offer a class here on um, infinite, right, or <laughs> infinity, and it would have to be a partnership, obviously, with like physics and mathematics and maybe religious yeah, studies, things like yeah, that. So, yeah. So um, we have a lot of like clapping, thank yous in the chat. Um, it was wonderful. Um, I, I'm not seeing any questions so far. <laughs> Thanks, sir. <laughs> Which yeah, seems let me a just, I'm, I'm seeing some of the comments as go. I'm sorry, I wasn't able to see those of you that made uh, chat comments as the talk was going. I really had to look at my slides and make sure I can get, <laughs> I'm an old man now, I can't get lost, right? <laughs> so um, I wasn't able to see those. Now I'm seeing some of those uh, to go, to go. By. Oh, well, so, the first question yeah, that we hey, have. Christy. Hi, Christy. Um, great, yeah. great to hear from you almost see you. Um, yeah, why did I choose those two figures? Um, well, those are those are two figures I have always admired. I, I the, the work life balance, the sense of perspective, um, the just the different it compromises, if you will, not a word everybody likes, but compromises that people have to make through their careers to figure out how to kind of put things together, um, how to put your your values and your your family considerations and just, you know, all of that kind of make all that work out. So, and I, I love Euler as a mathematician. I think Agnesi is un, underappreciated. Her calculus book is fabulous. It's got some really wonderful ideas. I've gotten ideas for teaching <laughs> calculus one uh, from Maria Agnesi's calculus book. We have another? Uh, we don't actually have another question. Okay. Um, 
But I did have a comment from Danica that I wanted to read that said, I've almost forgotten how much I enjoyed your lectures. It's been too long. And I was thinking too, if I had had you as a math professor, I would have loved math because you're just so enthusiastic and um, just uh, your passion for it comes through in your lecture. So thank well, you. Well, I'll tell you, you know, seventh or eighth week when that second exam rolls around, <laughs> as, as many of my listeners can tell you, the perspective is a little different. <laughs> so yeah, there's a lot of slogging through. Um, um, and I, I have loved, um, one of the reasons I have really loved Lawrence is that this, the, the wonderful attitude that our students have and have had all, all through the years I've been here, they, they want to learn, they're willing to work really hard. Um, they will ask questions when something isn't clear um, and they, they expect to make progress. It's just, it's just been great, so. Great. Yeah. Well, um, Cody said, thank you. I picked up a lot of fun ideas to use with my own calculus students next All year. Right. So I'm assuming you had Cody as a student at one point. Yes. Um, Dimitri asked, um, what uh, are you, are you going to miss anything about your academic work after you retire? The great coffee in the workroom. <laughs> yeah, I'll miss, I'll miss the people those students i'm going to hang around I'll, I'll be we're going we're going to stay in in the appleton area where, where we live now and we're going to uh you know we always go out to recitals and try to get i'll be able to go to more recitals and sporting events and you know convocations or whatever i'll just i won't uh won't be a stranger um but yeah but i'll miss i'll really miss the interacting with the students we have math tea once a week many many of you know about this um and so i think i'll come back occasionally for math tea and just try to meet some of the current students um, and see. Great. That everything's um, doing it right. Well, we do have a question. Um, how much cross-pollination was there between mathematicians in the 1700s? Oh, yeah. Were they mostly oh. referring you know, back to the same grades or able to interact with folks from different cities? Yeah, they were. They were. They wrote to each other extensively. Um, and the, the sort of um, the journal net, the journals were, um, more centered at the great institution. So it was actually a little harder to get your hands on those sometimes, but they wrote back and forth to each other all the time. And there was a large group of mathematicians in the 1700s that all kind of kept track with each other at different levels, not all people as good as Euler, um, but they, you know, it's kind of, what are you working on? What progress are you making and, and sharing ideas? It was very, it was a very fertile uh, time. There were some really, really hard problems that people were working on and there was a sense that we had kind of snow plowed the calculus that allowed us to sort of snow plow into some things and, and make some really good early progress. But now there were these really hard problems to think about. So there was a need for a lot of people to bring new ideas and just keep working. So, um, Susan okay. has a question. Was uh, Agnesi one of the few women math mathematics yeah, definitely. teachers? Yeah, I think there's, there's, a, there's a dispute about who the first woman professor at a European university was. <laughs> It's either her or another, another, another person. But yeah, yeah. I think the thing was that there was a, a very strong um, encouragement. I mean, in in some families, there was just a very strong encouragement to get all the all the education you could, and you know, so that's a wonderful thing. So uh, Jonas uh, had a comment. Thank you. I remember the department held Euler in yeah. high regard. It's been twenty five yeah. years ago now. Yeah, Euler, Euler is our yeah our official sort. <laughs> That, I think that was my fault. Now that I'm gone, we'll see. <laughs> we'll see if Euler gets the cred. <laughs> um, well, yeah, Christy I, does. I mentioned that. I just mentioned yeah. that formula that I showed with the pi squared over six. I know some of the some of you have seen uh, proofs of that. So. Uh, well, Kristen has a comment saying, as a long-time yeah. student of higher education, I appreciate the historical perspectives on faculty work life. I think that's I think that's important. Yeah. And I think it's important to connect our students with the with uh, historical developments in the subject, just to get an idea of what people were thinking about. Mathematics can be very intimidating. It's easy for it to be intimidating, and it's some of the one of the ways to kind of get that it pull down that intimidation factor is to put people in the heads of people who are grappling with difficult problems and just trying to get ideas makes it seem a little bit more doable. Um, well, Christy was asking, have you been able to make site visits to Bologna? Oh, or no, or we have not. We've been to Europe a couple of times. We haven't, yeah, we haven't done, haven't gotten to any of those places. That would be really fun. I'd um, love to go to St. Petersburg. 
that it, it'd be beautiful. Yeah. Um, Christina's comment. Um, I thank you for everything over the years. I hope it's all is good with your family and hope I did not mess up your son's math when he was in my geometry oh, class. No, he was, he was, he's good. <laughs> that's great. Well, I do think that's everything in the chat. Okay. Um, well, thank you all so much for attending yeah. and thank you. Oh, we do have a comment coming in your introduction to real analysis course, maybe change uh -oh. track. Now wow. I'm in trouble with the chemistry department, but that's okay. <laughs> awesome. Thanks, Jonas. That's great.